It's Get Out of Here. I'm Warren Levinson. Okay, this one's a little tricky. We're going to talk about Hong Kong. Now, anyone who's been paying the slightest bit of attention over the last six months knows that Hong Kong is in a struggle over the future it was promised when the Chinese government regained control of the territory 22 years ago. There are regular large pro-democracy protests, clashes between demonstrators and police are an almost daily occurrence. But Hong Kong, sophisticated, multicultural, unruly, noisy, lively, and beautiful Hong Kong, Hong Kong remains open to visitors, though their numbers have been cut about in half in recent months. It would be a little tone deaf of us to suggest this is the time to go and to take advantage of the deals being offered by the tour companies, the hotels and restaurants that are scrambling to replace missing visitors. But it would also be wrong, but it would also be wrong of us to tell you a place, but it would also be wrong to tell you that a place as vast as Hong Kong is just closed. We talked with Associated Press Paris correspondent John Lester, who's back from a recent reporting trip to the city, a place he knows very well. Hong Kong was John's first AP posting. He covered the years leading up to the British handover of the territory in 1997 and the years immediately afterward. Here with that conversation. Okay, so John Lester, here, here's the deal about Hong Kong. We look at the newspapers from Hong Kong or whatever, the whatever news there is, and it seems like an entire place that is completely – and it's certainly a very serious uh, political crisis, but it also seems like an entire place that is convulsed with disorder. What is it really like to be there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's OK. I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you the answer of the responsible journalist who should tell you um, to be careful. And I'm going to give you the answer of somebody who's known Hong Kong since um, he was a young man, which is no longer the case anymore, um, and fell in love with the place basically from the very first time I went there. Um, and that person's going to not be as responsible as the responsible journalist. So let's start with the responsible journalist. Now, um, there is a lot of disorder in Hong Kong, um, and some of it is very violent. Um, so anybody who's thinking of going there um, needs to take the necessary precautions. Um, those first precaution I would suggest would be looking up uh, your uh, country's um, either foreign office or foreign ministry or state department's uh, website and seeing what their latest advisory is because you don't want to be caught out and, um, you know, I don't know, some some development has happened in the situation in Hong Kong and, um, you know, maybe their travel advisory has changed. That's always a good place to start, I think, for anybody traveling anywhere, really. When you're there, um, you're going to find um, a city that, for all intents and purposes, in most of Hong Kong, um, looks fairly normal. But the trouble is, is you can never quite tell where things are going to go hairy, where the violence might suddenly pop up, because this is essentially, um, we're talking here about protests that are going um, violent. We're talking about, um, you know, police chasing after protesters, so running down streets, firing tear gas and rubber bullets. Um, and you don't want, you don't want to be caught out. It's a very fluid situation. Um, so you do have to be careful. Um, that said, uh, you know, there's lots of parts of Hong Kong that aren't affected by the, uh, riots um, at all. Um, and, um, because so many people are staying away, um, it's in a strange sort of way, um, almost an ideal time to visit. Um, you know, places where normally you would um, have a very long line of people um, has nobody. Um, Disneyland, for example. I mean, uh, we spent uh, an afternoon there um, and you don't have any cues on any of the rides. You just get on, do the ride, get back on the ride, do it again and again and again. And, um, you know, how often does that happen at Disneyland? Well, hardly ever, although I will have to say um, I can't imagine anybody from this country going to Hong Kong for Hong Kong Disney. <laughs> okay, I take your point. I mean, one thing also uh, that we haven't discussed yet, but we probably should, is, you know, the more sort of the moral question, should you go, should you not go? Um, I was quite interested, actually, because when I was there, I was there for three weeks uh, very recently covering the, the, the protests um, for the Associated Press. Um, and uh, one of the stories I did wrote about um, was about tourism and how the impact um, on tourism there. 
And the story that I wrote, um, I thought was fairly balanced. I mean, it explained basically what I've just said, that, um, you know, it is dangerous. It's very bad for people who are working in tourism. Obviously, um, you know, if you if you run a hotel, if you run a restaurant, uh, all the people who are dependent on the, you know, millions of people that come and now are staying away, then it's these are very painful times for them. But I did also point out that if you're a tourist who does come, um, that you're going to find some changes in the sense that you're going to find some upsides too. And I was quite surprised by the reaction of some people who read that story and and sort of criticized me saying that um, that it was almost immoral that, that to suggest that this was a good time to go to Hong Kong. And I do take that point. I mean, I suppose you could say the same thing about people who go on holiday or go traveling rather to places like North Korea or other places, you know, there's always the question of should you go? Um, now, I throw that out there just as a question. Um, I'm not going to get into that. I think that's really a, a personal choice. Right. But what do you think a tourist is saying politically, if anything, about I've decided that this is a time I want to go to Hong Kong? Well, I actually did meet some tourists who had gone specifically because of the protests. Um, uh, people who felt that this is a, a you know a key moment in history in the history of China. Um, we spoke to one person uh, who'd come all the way over from South America. Um, and he was saying, look, the last time something this big happened was Tiananmen Square in 1989, and that was a historical time. Um, and, you know, now there are protests in Hong Kong, and I just had you know, come from Mexico, actually, now I remember clearly, um, and had come over specifically to, the, to this and got off the plane. And what the first, when we talked to him, he was like, where are the protests? And we sort of directed him down the street, you know, just followed the smell of the tear gas, you'll find them, find them pretty easily. <laughs> um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, again, I mean, it's, you know, these these are personal choices. I don't know if I can weigh into into whether you should or you shouldn't. But um, it is a, it is a momentous time in Hong Kong. Um, it all again. I, I I think this has to be stressed. It's is very fluid. You know. I mean, the question that everybody's asking at the moment is, you know, after we're now in protests are now in their sixth month. So the question is, is, you know, at what point are the leaders in Beijing, uh, the Chinese communist leaders, um, going to say enough is enough? Um, and how might they react? Might there be another Tiananmen? Uh, might they send in the army? I um, mean, these are questions that Hong Kong people are asking themselves, too. Um, and obviously, if you're a tourist, um, you don't want to be caught up, I wouldn't have thought, um, in that sort of event. Um, and there's no guarantee uh, that that sort of event is not just around the corner. Um, nobody has that crystal ball. So all, those are all things that you need to sort of consider in, in into making this 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 decision about whether this is a good time to go. There's also the, a question from a, from a certain point of view that perhaps Hong Kong is an extraordinary place and it has this kind of freedom that you don't generally get in a police state that because the possibility lurks that the government in Beijing might actually crack down, that we could be witnessing the last days of that Hong Kong. And you kind of want to, you know, if you're interested, you might kind of want to see that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's also an argument to say that, OK, I mean, for instance, we went up to the peak, which is what, one of the you know must visit sites for Hong Kong. The view, um, this is on Hong Kong Island and the view of Hong Kong from there is absolutely knockout. I mean, the the, the skyscrapers at night all lit up in with their neon and um, it's it's sort of Blade Runner sort of view, really, and, and just spectacular view all, all the way into the hills that are leading towards China. Um, and North Normally, uh, there would be queues maybe two, three hours long just to get on the peak tram, which is a rickety old uh, tram that dates back to the last century, to get up there. Um, and there'd be queues at the top. Well, now there's nobody on the peak tram. And when you get up there, um, the restaurants that have these spectacular views, I mean, we spoke to restaurateurs there, they had to, not a single person there. Um, and, you know, saying that if this carries on, then they're going to have to shut down. So, you know, by going and spending your tourist dollars, your tourist euros or whatever it is, you know, you are helping um, Hong Kong people sort of maybe, you know, make ends meet during a very difficult time. I suppose that there's that consideration, too. Right. As entirely aside from the politics, you are supporting people's livelihoods. So there is there's that aspect of it. Mm hmm. This is Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast. I'm Warren Levinson talking with uh, AP correspondent John Lester, who recently visited Hong Kong, one of many trips he's taken. And we'll be back with more, including uh, what makes Hong Kong such a special place for John Lester, right after this. 
It's Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, talking with John Lester about Hong Kong. So you said at the outset, John, you fell in love with Hong Kong years ago. So what is it about Hong Kong that draws you back? Well, this is uh, radio, so um, thankfully it's not uh, video, because if uh, if uh, if it was, you would have noticed that I came back from Hong Kong with um, a slightly broader waistline than I had when I first went there. My wife noticed it straight away when I came back. Um, the food uh, has to be top of the list, um, I think, not maybe right at the very top, but pretty much close to the top. Um, Hong Kong is just a great place to to just eat uh, to your heart's content, and that's part of the pleasure I think of going there. Um, the um, uh, the skyline, the the urban environment of Hong Kong, um, it's uh, sort of like Manhattan. If you imagine Manhattan, sort of uh, scrumpled, you put, take Manhattan in your hand, scrumple it all up um, like a little ball, and then you've kind of got Hong Kong. Basically, I mean the 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 canyons there of skyscrapers are uh, feel even more canyony than they. They do in say Manhattan the 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 urban sort of squeeze everybody's squeezed together um uh when I was there as a as a as a young reporter I, I wrote a story once about how um when I was in my kitchen I could literally reach out through the window of my kitchen and take the food out of the wok of my neighbor's kitchen which was right next door I mean you know with a pair of uh, uh, chopsticks I could have st- stolen his whole lunch um in every- <laughs> Everybody is on top of each other, um, and uh, that's an incredible feeling too. You know, I kind of love that. Um, maybe not to live, but to visit, it's quite something. Um, the is also a maritime city. Um, you know, it's it was a port. It was it was uh, valuable to the to the British when they took it over as a colony because it was a port. So it was a gateway into China, um, and that sort of mixture of urban plus you know the 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 boats that you you have right there um you know everything from big ocean liners to the little hong kong um star ferry which has not changed the beautiful old diesel ferry that zips back and forth across um from kowloon back to hong kong island with the sailors who run that in their very traditional sailors uniforms um that's a real pleasure too um and then you've got you know certain sites obviously the peak i mentioned that fabulous views incredible views um there's the giant buddha on lantau islands that's another place where there's been um really no process at all um again a huge gigantic buddha that people like to climb up and have a view over to uh, macau another uh, former colony uh, that used to be portuguese um and then over the south china sea um and it's just yeah it's also if you like to shop then uh, you can shop till you drop and uh, uh in hong kong too and um and it is true that because of uh the disruption to tourism i mean hotels are ridiculously cheap at the moment um the the number of tourists has, has been halved. Um, so some of the hotels are offering just ridiculous deals. I spoke to a South African uh, um, uh, couple, it's a brother and sister, and they were visiting. And the gentleman was telling me that when he booked his hotel a few months ago, um, the room was 2000 Hong Kong dollars a night. So that's, uh, let me think, I think something around, I think about 200 US, something that maybe. Right. But anyway, um, when he um, when he actually got around to paying the bill, it was actually five hundred dollars a night. So um, it was a quarter of what he'd expected to pay because um, the hotel had just slashed prices so much to try and keep um, people, you know, coming. Right. So you might feel a little like a vulture and taking advantage of uh, of unrest, but on the other hand, there's something about really low prices that is attractive, especially in a place so steeped in. Uh, in views and history. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, the vulture thing, like I said before, I absolutely take that point. Uh, I, can, I can see where people um, might feel that way. Um, I'm not sure that that's how Hong Kong people feel. Um, I was... I uh, can't tell you the number of times that people thanked me for coming. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to see us. Thank you. Tell the world what's happening here. Um, not once did anybody say, you know, uh, look, can't you see how serious this is? What do you what do you think you're doing here? Um, obviously, I was there as a journalist, not um, as a tourist. But um, uh, my sense was very much people in Hong Kong do not want to be forgotten. They don't want to become a backwater of, of, of China. So, um 
I, I, you know, that that vulture idea, um, I don't think was is one that you'll meet when you're there. And when you said uh, at the beginning, as a responsible journalist, I would tell you if you're coming here, you need to take precautions. What sort of precautions are we talking about? Well, uh, I think staying abreast of uh, the situation is very, very important. Uh, you know, you want to be reading the newspapers in the morning as you're um, as you're having your breakfast, just to see, you know, where are the protests expected? Um, where might they be? Um, for example. Um, you know that the 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 weekends tend to be um, uh, co- uh, when protests are concentrated. Well, you might want to think about staying away from the very centre of Hong Kong during those times. I mean, there was one day, for example, when um, I was covering a protest, and uh, this was in the ce- in in centre of Hong Kong on Hong Kong Island, and. Um, you know, I had my tear gas mask on, I had my, uh, my goggles, my helmet, um, and it was, um, really quite hairy. I mean, um, you know, uh, bricks being thrown from, by the protesters, fire, um, uh, petrol, gasoline bombs, uh, um, and then you had police firing tear gas the other way, and, and it becomes a sort of cat and mouse chase where the police are chasing after protesters, firing tear gas as they go, and they ran straight headlong into a bunch of tourists who happened to be, um, drinking beers and all the rest of it. And, you know, I saw couples with, you know, young babies in prams running as fast as they could to get out of this choking tear gas. And I, I wouldn't say that that's, I can't imagine that that's a pleasurable experience for anybody. So you really want to be, you know, careful about where, you, where you're going to be when, um, uh, but then again, I mean, I'm sure that this is something that your hotel could help you with. Um, uh, you know, talk to them in the morning. Um, you need to really keep your ear to the ground. And uh, there are many places in Hong Kong that are not affected by these these protests. The islands, for example, I met some some tourists I was talking to who said that they'd spent the weekend. Um, they'd been there for a, over a week, I think it was, um, and they had basically decided that um, during the week they would visit um, the Hong Kong island and some of its sites. Um, but at the weekends they would get out of town and go and visit the islands. There's some beautiful little islands that are well worth visiting, um, and where there haven't been any protests. Protests. Right. I wanted to talk about that, um, about the islands, the quiet fishing villages, the places, because we, we focus so much on the center of Hong Kong. Are these places that are really um, beautiful and tranquil unto themselves, or are they just beautiful and tranquil compared to the urban environment that you're getting away from? No, they're fabulous. I mean, really, uh, if you, you know, you come to get, get from central Hong Kong, there's all sorts of little ferries um, that run regularly. I'm talking sort of every 20 minutes, 30 minutes um, that will take you off to any number of these small islands. And they're a world in a world, you know, they're completely different from the craziness of Hong Kong. And um, and yes, very much more the sort of traditional uh you know south china sea little fishing village sort of thing there are some beautiful country parks as well in hong kong where the where the um the fabulous hiking to be done um too so uh I, yes everybody wants to see the big sky skyscrapers the urban the urbanness of hong kong the shopping all those things the you know the malls that seem to never never go to sleep those those types of things um the food um but um there are so many little hidden gems in Hong Kong out of the, off the beaten track. I suppose that's true everywhere, but you know, you take a little ferry, uh, it's maybe a half an hour ride. You've got the, you've got the sea, um, you get there and it's, you know, just have a wander around these little villages and hop back on and you know, you're back in, back in town again. So it's definitely worth doing. Wow. It does seem great. John Lester, I really appreciate you taking the time. This has been just terrific. That's a real pleasure. John Lester, an AP reporter and columnist based in Paris, is back from a reporting trip to Hong Kong. We spoke before the confrontations between police and protesters moved into the city's universities. The State Department recommends Americans who travel to Hong Kong exercise increased caution. It doesn't recommend that they don't go. And now, my favorite trip. If you were listening last week, and if you weren't, you can put this show on pause and go back and download it. That's okay. We'll wait. Anyway, if you were listening last week, you heard the AP's Courtney Bonnell talk about what she learned about traveling alone on a recent trip to Barcelona. This week, another perspective on solo travel. Patty Sullivan, a retired screenwriter who decided after the breakup of a 26-year relationship that not having a traveling companion was no reason to keep her home, she went to Rwanda last month to see the gorillas described by the late primate researcher Diane Fossey. I decided I really wanted to see the silverback gorillas. I knew it was a real big hike to get there. 
And I figured, you know, before I get much older, I'm 64, um, I should do this now. So I, I took a flight and I had one guy, I arranged for one guy to drive me around. And um, we became very close. That's one thing that, I mean, you know, Michael Crichton wrote about this in a really interesting way. He wrote the book uh, Travels. Did you ever read Travels? No, okay. Well, it's, it's travel inward and travel outward. He does one with direct experience with nature and another with direct experience with, say, you know, uh, swimming with sharks or whatever. Um, and one would be meditating with a cactus in the desert. But since I read that book, I, I, I started to understand the significance of being alone in the world by yourself, your own spirit, your own everything. And um, so I went, I went to Rwanda, and I was by myself, and I was told to get ready to do the climb. And the trek is forever. It takes hours and hours to get up to the rainforest. And I was up where Diane Fossey had her place, and her grave is up there. And, um, and you walk. And, and as you're walking um, for four hours in mudslides vertically, um, you know, you really put to the test your body. And there's a way in which... It's just you. You can't. There's no one to bitch at, or there's no one to say, "God damn it! Why did we choose to do this?" There's none, none of that. It's just, I'm in this. These are the elements. I'm in. Go with it. And you go. And you know, finally, when we got up to where the gorillas were, um, it was extraordinary. I, I, um, I, I, I saw them, and I was very close to them. Um, you're not allowed to touch them because we share 98 percent of our DNA with them, and you can give them a flu, cold, anything like that. But to look at them and to look at their faces and what beautiful beasts they are in this setting that is so off the grid, um, it blew my heart open. And I stood there and I was, I felt like, oh my God, like my heart is going to explode. Like these things are so beautiful and that I am so privileged that I get to like come here and look them in the eye and watch their baby swing with them and the mother's breastfeed. And then, you know, Diane Fossey had um, created the way to speak with them. And she, she lived with them, as you know, for years. And she broke down all of their behaviors. And so when you go, you know, the, the trackers, which go up with you, um, they have a language with them that Diane Fossey taught them. And so you go near them and you go like... <clears throat> And that's telling them everything's going to be okay. This is really, this is good. And then they go, mm, mm, and you're like, I'm talking with a gorilla. <laughs> it's like so amazing. And, um, and they're beautiful and they're playful and they're fun. And it wasn't mediated by anybody else's needs. You know, I had my own connection to them and I didn't have a partner like, oh, are you too wet? Oh, are you getting a cold? Oh, you have to go sit down. Are you? It's just, it was like my spirit was there with their spirit. Patty Sullivan is a retired screenwriter. She lives in New Jersey. And that's the show. Get Out of Here is a production of the Associated Press and Westwood One produced under the supervision of Nikesa Moody and Peter Costanzo. I'm Warren Levinson. We'll see you next time.